Well, hello there, everybody. This is Nurse Mo, and welcome back to the Straight A Nursing Podcast. I am so excited that you're here. This is episode 137, and today we will be talking about acute respiratory distress syndrome. You may also hear it called ARDS or simply ARDS. And the reason you've probably heard of this is because it does tend to be happening quite a bit in patients with COVID-19 respiratory involvement. So we'll be diving into that today. Before we do that, though, you guys know I love to take a minute and give a quick listener shout out. I'm so thankful for all the listeners on this podcast. Recently, we had a bonus episode go up when we celebrated our one millionth download. Hello. Well, it took me a while to get that episode put together. And now we are almost to 2 million downloads. So I appreciate you guys so, so, so much. So this listener shout out goes out to Liv, who writes this. This content shouldn't be free because it's just that good. However, I'm so thankful it is because I'm a broke nursing student. The knowledge, expertise, and wisdom that NurseMo provides and the Straight A Nursing Podcast set it apart from every other nursing school resource on the internet. I love being able to find a topic I'm learning about in school and listen to one of Nurse Mo's podcast episodes to get a perspective that is different from my professors. My whole apartment complex probably thinks I'm insane from hearing me shout out answers to the pod quizzes, but I don't care. I'm just so thankful this resource is available. Nurse Mo, you rock, sending you lots of love from Mississippi. Liv, thank you so much. You are the one that rocks. You guys are all the ones that rock. And I totally remember what it was like to be a broke nursing student and how much I would have loved a resource like this. So I'm just so happy that it is helping you and that you love the pod quizzes and that your apartment complex neighbors think that you've uh, lost it a little bit. That just made me laugh. That made my day. So thank you so much, Liv, for reaching out. Okay, so now let's dive into our topic today, which again is acute respiratory distress syndrome. So ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, is the most severe form of lung injury. And as I said, it happens to be really prevalent as of late due to that COVID-19. So ARDS is characterized as non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, meaning it's pulmonary edema not caused by heart failure. And it is also characterized as a severe malfunction of the alveolar capillary membrane. So I'll say that again. ARDS is characterized as non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema and severe malfunction of the alveolar capillary membrane. And when you guys think about what happens at the alveolar capillary membrane, right, that's where gas exchange happens, that's where the magic happens, there's severe dysfunction with that process. In addition to COVID-19, the novel coronavirus, major risk factors for ARDS are sepsis, aspiration, oxygen toxicity, severe pancreatitis, pneumonia, and trauma. The hospital mortality rate is estimated to be between 35 and 46 percent, with more severe cases obviously having the poorest outcomes. So today we'll be going through ARDS and we'll be using the straight A nursing latte method with that, which is that streamlined approach that we use to learn about disease conditions. So if you haven't yet learned the latte method, it provides you with a very consistent, a very focused framework that helps you really zero in on the most important information. So you save time and you study more effectively. Before we dive into latte though, I do want to cover the path the physiology of ARDS a little bit. So in healthy lungs, the alveoli are participating in gas exchange optimally, right? You're breathing in air or oxygen, and you're breathing out carbon dioxide. But when the lung is injured, both the alveoli and that interstitial space accumulate 
excess fluid. And this leads to increased pulmonary pressure, decreased lung compliance, and impaired gas exchange. So if you don't understand how any of that works together, the big one you need to know is it's going to impair gas exchange. So in ARDS, that lung injury causes the release of inflammatory cytokines. And this leads to the arrival of those neutrophils, which then release these toxic mediators, causing further damage to the alveolar epithelium and capillary endothelium. As a result, fluid will accumulate in the interstitial space and there's a loss of surfactant leading to collapse of the alveoli. Okay. So let's go through the short, short version of that, okay? So in healthy lungs, your alveoli are participating in gas exchange, right? They're basically the component of that process. And then when the lung is injured, the alveoli and the interstitial space accumulate excess fluid, and now we have impaired gas exchange along with some other things. Then there's that release of the cytokines. The neutrophils come in. They release toxic mediators. There's more damage to the alveolar epithelium and capillary endothelium. We get more fluid accumulation in the interstitial space and a loss of surfactant in the alveoli, causing them to collapse. Okay, we got that. Are we clear on kind of the pathophysiology of ARDS? Okay, so let's go through the key factors using the LATTE method. So the L in the LATTE method is how will your patient look? So a patient with ARDS will be in severe respiratory distress of acute onset that is characterized by things like tachypnea. They could have anxiety. They could be very restless, very confused. Left untreated, this will deteriorate into respiratory failure into fatigue, they're using their accessory muscles to breathe, and their lung sounds can become very, very coarse. You may hear crackles initially. I have heard patients with ARDS have lung sounds so coarse that when you put your stethoscope on their chest, it literally sounds like a washing machine. So that is a very, very bad sign of just a ton of fluid accumulation in that space. The chest x-ray on this patient will show bilateral infiltrates, which you may hear referred to as a whiteout. You may hear the term ground glass opacities. Either way, what they're talking about is when you're looking at the chest x-ray of a patient with ARDS, there's this fluffy, cottony, cloud-like appearance to the lungs. And I will include a link for what a typical ARDS chest x-ray looks like in the show notes. Once you see it, you get it and you'll know what I'm talking about. Also in a patient with ARDS, they will have a PF ratio that is less than 200 with a normal pulmonary artery wedge pressure. And that normal range is less than 18 milligrams of mercury. So again, The PF ratio will be low, but the pulmonary artery wedge pressure will be normal. Okay, and if you guys don't understand what a PF ratio is, I want to invite you to check out my article on that, and I will link to that in the show notes as well. It's a very simple calculation that you can do, and the numbers basically can give you an indicator if your patient is in ARDS. So again, as far as how the patient looks, they're going to be in severe respiratory distress. Their x-ray is going to be abnormal with that patchy, cloudy, white appearance to it. And then their PF ratio will be low. They will also have low oxygenation on their PaO2 and as well as a low PaCO2 due to that hyperventilation that occurs in that early stage of respiratory distress. So when the patient is tachypnic, they're blowing off their CO2, right? So that PaCO2 is going to be low. But as the patient tires, and it doesn't take too terribly terribly long for this to occur. The body's not going to be able to maintain that increased respiratory rate, that increased respiratory effort. So then the PaCO2 will begin to rise as that respiratory acidosis 
develops. So that's the L in latte. Um, if you're new to the latte method, it's not super literal when we say just how will the patient look. It's kind of like a summation of their overall clinical presentation. What are the key things that you're going to notice about this patient? So again, respiratory distress, that cloudy, patchy white spots on the chest x-ray, a low PF ratio, and low oxygenation with maybe initially a low PaCO2 as well, but then that'll come up and the patient will be in a respiratory acidosis. So how are you going to assess the patient? That's what the A in LATTE stands for, assessment. So assessing a patient with ARDS focus primarily on that respiratory system with an eye toward preventing complications. So you'll be assessing the patient's respiratory rate, their work of breathing, and you really are watching very closely for the use of accessory muscles, especially, you know, in that period before the patient gets intubated. Most patients with ARDS will be intubated. You'll monitor their oxygen saturation level via pulse oximetry. Consider assessing end tidal carbon dioxide with waveform capnography if the patient is not yet intubated. Once the patient is intubated, end tidal waveform capnography is part of that circuit that is utilized. But prior to intubation, you can use end tidal waveform capnography as a way to monitor for hypercapnia. If you want to learn more about end tidal CO2 monitoring with waveform capnography, check out episode 112. You'll also want to be assessing for arrhythmias because that hypoxemia can precipitate arrhythmias. So you'll be monitoring their cardiac status. Most of these patients with ARDS will be in the critical care setting and have that continuous monitoring in place. You also want to keep a close eye for potential complications such as pneumothorax, that's going to be secondary to that high pressure ventilation that occurs with ARDS, ventilator acquired pneumonia, which we're going to try very hard to prevent, and deep vein thrombosis, which is secondary to immobility, sepsis, trauma, and the coagulopathies that can occur with sepsis. You'll also keep a very close eye on your patient's mental status. So as oxygen levels decrease, the patient may become confused, very disoriented, lethargic, or even restless and combative. This is the patient that is taking off their oxygen mask, taking off their leads, trying to pull their gown off, trying to get out of bed. You know, and this patient was, you know, perfectly normal half an hour ago and talking to you and understanding things. And now they've suddenly become very confused, disoriented, and even uncooperative or combative. As the CO2 increases, the patient is now getting very fatigued. He'll typically become quite somnolent or even obtunded. So you guys, if you've got a patient who's been on oxygen, okay, and you suspect some severe underlying respiratory disorder, and they suddenly get that level of confusion, that restlessness, they're taking off their leads, their gown, they won't put their oxygen mask on, they won't leave it in place, whatever that is. And then suddenly after a while, they're nice and calm and they're you're resting and you think, oh, Bob finally fell asleep. I'm going to leave him be. My advice would be don't just leave him be. Go and check that Bob wakes to voice or light touch. If Bob is difficult to rouse or unarousable, it's very likely that he has now become obtunded with very high CO2 levels and possibly also with that low oxygen levels as well. So don't just be uh, you know quick to assume that your patient just fell asleep. A lot of times it is because of an acidosis situation that they have calmed down. Okay, little tip there for you. You. you also want to assess the patient's lung sounds, which initially could just be those fine crackles, but again, like I said, could become very coarse lung sounds that you will hear. So just a quick recap, your main assessments for a patient with ARDS are respiratory effort, respiratory rate, use of those accessory muscles, their oxygen saturation level, possibly also adding in waveform capnography to monitor end tidal CO2. We're going to watch for any arrhythmias, so they're on the cardiac monitor. We're going to keep an eye on potential complications that could occur, um, being aware that pneumothorax could occur, 
deep vein thrombosis, you know, with a resulting pulmonary embolism could occur, ventilator acquired pneumonia as well. We're also watching their mental status and their lung sounds. So the first T in the LATTE method is for tests. What tests are likely to be ordered for a patient with ARDS or suspected ARDS? So an arterial blood gas would be my first go-to test that I would want the MD to order. This test is going to show that respiratory acidosis, or it could be that it shows a mixed acidosis disorder if sepsis is also an underlying factor, which it often is. Pan cultures will likely be ordered since ARDS can be a complication of sepsis of some kind of an infection. When we say pan culture, we mean get everything. So a pan culture would be a sputum culture, a blood culture, and a urine culture. If the patient has an active open wound, we would also culture that as well. So we're getting everything when we say a pan culture. The chest x-ray would also be ordered, and that again is going to show those white areas known as infiltrates, whiteout, or ground glass opacities. These abnormalities can take a little while to develop. It could be, you know, up to like 24 hours before you start to see it on the chest x-ray. Some other things that they may order for this patient are diagnostic testing of the bronchial lavage washing. So this involves the patient getting a bronchoscopy, and that will help determine if there's any specific pathogen colonizing the lungs. They may also get a CT scan of the chest. A CBC, again, would be ordered on any patient with suspected infection. And then you'll be monitoring their blood glucose as well, especially in critically ill patients. So patient that is septic or going septic or risk for sepsis. And then in patients receiving glucocorticoid therapy, which many patients with ARDS do receive. So now let's move on to the second T in LATTE, which is treatments. What treatments are going to be provided to a patient with ARDS? So as with many disease conditions, and you've probably figured this out by now, many, many times the treatment is going to be basically addressing whatever that underlying problem is. So while this is underway, so for example, if the patient has an infection or a sepsis, you're treating that. If they've got a pneumonia, you're treating that. If they've got a trauma, you're treating that. But while we're doing all of those things, other treatments that we will pr provide for our patient with ARDS include mechanical ventilation. So with ARDS, we try to use low tidal volumes to maintain plateau pressures below 30 centimeters of water or using pressure control mode to keep plateau pressures below 30. So if you want to learn more about mechanical ventilation, you can take a quick detour to episode 83. So check out episode 83 if you want to learn a little bit more about mechanical ventilation. They may also use mechanical ventilation with something called inverse ratio ventilation. And this is usually used in more severe cases. So in this mode of ventilation, we're shortening the inspiratory phase and extending out the expiratory phase. Again, it's called inverse ratio ventilation because our natural breathing pattern is actually the opposite of that. So forcing the patient to breathe in this inverse way is very, very uncomfortable. So these patients absolutely must be adequately ventilated. Otherwise, they're just going to fight the ventilator and not get adequate ventilation. We also want to use occasionally high frequency oscillatory ventilation. And now this is for the patient who we've tried all the other vent modes, we've tried everything else, but they continue to be hypoxic. This ventilation mode is intense, you guys. It delivers 300 to 3,000 breaths per minute to the patient. So it sounds like a, a just a, almost like a, 
Okay, imagine what a jackhammer sounds like, like that fast, but not as harsh of a sound, of course, but just that rate. That's kind of what the high frequency ventilator sounds like. So again, if you think inverse ratio ventilation sounded uncomfortable, can you imagine what this is like? These patients actually have to be more than sedated. They have to also be chemically paralyzed. And we should talk about that. That is worth an entire podcast episode in and of itself. So let's write myself a note to remember to do that. And then when you have your mechanically ventilated patients, what we do with these is we typically follow something called the ARDS net protocol. And with this protocol, we use high PEEP Okay, so high pressures in order to keep FiO2 as low as possible. Please note that high PEEP is going to increase intrathoracic pressure. And when we increase intrathoracic pressure, we decrease venous return. Thereby, we reduce cardiac output. We also put the patient at risk for things like a pneumo thorax, which I believe I mentioned earlier. So on a patient with a high PEEP, if they've got significantly reduced cardiac output, they may need a medication that helps increase cardiac output and keep their blood pressure up as a result. And in very, very, very severe situations, a treatment that may be used is ECMO. And of course, I've got a resource for that for you, which I will link to in the show notes for you. Okay, so another treatment that could be provided for your patient with ARDS is simply what position we lie them in. So prone positioning is being utilized more and more for patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome. And remember, prone means face down. So the theory behind prone positioning is that it helps expand those dependent lung areas. It also opens collapsed alveoli and increases ventilation capacity. So placing patients into this prone position is going to redistribute the blood and the airflow throughout the lungs more evenly, which improves gas exchange. Prone positioning can also reduce pressure placed on the lungs by the heart, those great vessels, and even the abdominal organs, and that reduces work of breathing. So patients who are prone typically require less ventilatory support, and that leads to decreased risk of all those ventilator complications. Additionally, prone positioning can improve cardiac function by increasing preload and decreasing constriction of pulmonary vessels. And one more benefit, secretions are more likely to drain out of the mouth and the nose versus down into the lungs where they can continue to cause problems for the patient. So I absolutely have a blog article about this as well, which I will link to in the show notes for you guys. So as the patient with ARDS improves and requires less support from the ventilator, then one of the treatments that you will be doing is called a daily awakening trial and spontaneous breathing trial. And in a perfect world, these two things are coordinated, right? If you're going to give the patient a chance to start doing more of the ventilatory effort, you want them to be as unsedated as you possibly can. So you'll be working with your respiratory therapist to time the occurrence of that daily awakening and daily spontaneous breathing trial. And if you would like to learn more about ventilator weaning, then check out episode 32 where I talk about that. So recovery from ARDS can be a really long road. Many patients will require a temporary tracheostomy and with that, a temporary peg tube for long-term tube feeding. In many cases, that tracheostomy, again, is temporary, but in very severe cases where the patient never really recovers from that, they could have a permanent tracheostomy. And again, you know, speaking of those peg tubes, even before we get to the tracheostomy and peg tube 
part of the recovery, we are going to start nutrition early. Patients with ARDS who are on a ventilator will get an OG tube placed at the time of intubation so that enteral nutrition can be started right away. If the patient is prone, and I talk about this in that article about proning for your ARDS patients, most feeding tubes are just going to go down into um, the stomach, high risk for aspiration with that. So when your patient is prone, we're not going to be obviously able to sit them up at that 30 degree height that we do with our patients who are just on a ventilator and in the supine or semi-fowler's position, we need to get that feeding tube post-pyloric. So it will extend into the duodenum or the jejunum, and that reduces the risk of aspiration. The patient may also get glucocorticoid therapy with something like methylprednisolone or dexamethasone. That may be used. That's going to cause that blood sugar to spike and go up. So you will definitely be watching your patient's blood sugar levels. And then furosemide and albumin may be needed to remove excess fluid, and that can help improve oxygenation. So think about why do we use these two medications in tandem? So they get the albumin, and what does that do? If you remember your oncotic pressures and all of that and how the big proteins are going to increase pressure, it's going to pull fluid into the vascular space, and then we follow that up with the furosemide to drive that fluid out of the body through the kidney. So it's like a one-two punch, albumin and furosemide. So when your MD orders this combo, it's important that you do it in the right order. You wouldn't give the furosemide first and then the albumin. You want to give the albumin and follow that with the furosemide. And then another treatment could be inhaled vasodilators. Currently, those are under investigation and being studied as a treatment modality. This would include inhaled nitric oxide and prostacyclin. So if you see those in your clinical setting, please write and let me know how they're working out for your patients. Okay, so that was a lot. Lots of treatments for a patient with ARDS. I'm just going to run down the list very quickly. So mechanical ventilation using low tidal volumes, inverse ratio ventilation possibly needed, high frequency oscillatory ventilation in severe cases, and then ECMO in the most severe cases. Again, we're going to be following that ARDSNET protocol, and that typically uses that high PEEP to keep FiO2 levels as low as possible. And with that, you guys, I'm saying that you would look at an ABG of a patient with ARDS and see a... PaO2 in the 60s, and that's fine um, per most ARDSNET protocol indicators. That would be adequate enough to um, consider the patient on the appropriate ventilator setting. So it's not like we're aiming for that super high, like 80% uh, PaO2. It's going to be on the lower side. We're trying to keep oxygen delivery as low as we possibly can, and in order to do that, we increase the PEEP. We also could prone position these patients, and that's not just patients that are on ventilators. Patients that are not intubated can prone position. They can even prone position themselves when they feel like they need improved gas exchange. We are going to be doing daily awakening and spontaneous breathing trials as the patient starts to improve. And the patient may need a temporary tracheostomy. They may need a temporary peg tube. We're definitely going to get nutrition started as early as possible, and that will be an OG tube in your ventilated patient or something post-pyloric if we are proning the patient. And when I say OG tube, you guys, most of the time, like when you're in nursing school, you learn how to place an NG tube, right? It goes up through the nares. It's nasogastric. When the patient is intubated and we expect that tube to be in for a bit, we pop it in through the mouth, orogastric. So that's why it's an OG tube. And then they may get glucocorticoid therapy. Therapy. You're going to be watching the blood sugar levels with that. Your patient may get that albumin furosemide combo to get that excess fluid off. And then inhaled vasodilators could be part of the treatment plan. Okay, you guys, whew, that was a lot. So with any kind of patient condition, we definitely want to educate the patient educate the family. And that's what the E in LATTE stands for. So many times the individual who has the ARDS is so, so ill that your teaching will mostly be towards the family. As the patient improves, your teaching will start to include him or her as well. So some key education components to include in your plan of care 
are things like if the patient is paralyzed um, and sedated, it's very upsetting for the family to see their loved one in basically a medically induced coma. Even if they're not paralyzed, but they're still very sedated, they need to understand what to expect when they see the patient and the rationales and the need for those things. A lot of times families want their loved ones to be awake and interacting with them. And you just need to gently explain why that isn't possible right now. It's because we need compliance with the ventilator so that we can improve oxygenation as much as possible. Educate the patient, educate the family about the need for frequent ventilator-acquired pneumonia prevention interventions. This includes oral care, the head of bed positioning. You wouldn't want the family member to be changing the head of bed positioning. Um, if the patient is prone, obviously that doesn't apply, but in patients who are not prone, head of bed is set at 30 degrees. Many intubated patients that aren't sedated will resist having oral care performed just be aware of that, that that will happen. So if your intubated patient is awake and is able to understand instructions, getting them to cooperate with the oral care makes it so much easier to do an accurate and really thorough job with that. If the patient is receiving prolonged mechanical ventilation, discuss the weaning process with the family. Let them um, understand and know what to expect. It can take a long time, and families typically feel a lot of stress and uncertainty when they know um, or, or when they don't know what to expect. So if you can help them understand, the typical weaning process, how long it might take and what it involves, that'll be really helpful for them, especially if they're at the bedside during the awakening and spontaneous breathing trial. Waking up a patient who is on a ventilator who does have some respiratory distress, they're typically very, very anxious, and that can be hard for the family member to, to deal with, and they may interrupt a lot and agitate the patient when really what they should do is just be still and calm and be a calming presence. But that's hard. You know, people get stressed when they, you know, they're not used to seeing their loved one like this. You and I, we see it all the time. We're used to it. But think about the person who doesn't see this all the time and for whom it is their loved one. So very, very stressful for them as well. If the patient is being placed into that prone position, ensure the family knows what to expect, especially if you're using a specialty bed such as a roto-prone. These beds are very intimidating. They don't provide really any access to the patient for the family, and they can feel really disconnected and um, very intimidated and stressed by that. So make sure that they understand what to expect. And then, of course, you will provide your emotional support to the family. So there you have it, you guys. I hope this brief overview helps you take care of your ARDS patients, whether you are in clinical, on the job, or even just taking a nursing school exam. So before we stop, let's take a moment. Let's do a few pod quiz questions because I know you guys love those. And just a, I hesitate to announce this too soon because my projects always take so much longer than I think they're going to because undoubtedly I will run into some technology issue, but um, I'm working on a premium podcast for you guys that will essentially be mostly pod quizzes. So I'm super excited about bringing that to you. And um Stay tuned for more info. I expect to have a more definitive date sometime, probably in the next month or so. So look forward to that. So in the meantime, let's do a few pod quiz questions. So if you're not sure what a pod quiz question is, I ask a question and I pause, hopefully long enough for you to think of the answer, and then I tell you the answer. So it's basically like doing flashcards for your ears. Okay, so in the pathophysiology of ARDS, what happens to surfactant? So in ARDS, there is a loss of surfactant. And what happens to the alveoli when we lose surfactant? It collapses very, very good. Okay. And then when we're looking at our patient with ARDS, what will that chest x-ray look like? So some of the terms you may hear used are 
bilateral infiltrates, whiteout, or ground glass opacities. For your observation, when you look at it, it looks kind of fluffy, cloudy, cottony white. You'll definitely be able to recognize it. It's extremely distinctive. In ARDS, what will be your uh, level for a PF ratio? That PF ratio will be less than 200. Very, very good. Okay, so let's move on and let's talk about some of the... What happens to your patient's CO2 as he becomes fatigued? So as your patient becomes fatigued, his CO2 is going to increase. Very, very good. Okay, so when we're looking at our diagnostic testing, how would you obtain bronchial lavage washings? What procedure would enable the MD to get those bronchial lavage washings? That would be from a bronchoscopy. Very, very good. What lab result are you going to follow very closely in your patients getting glucocorticoid therapy? We're going to be monitoring their serum glucose levels. Very, very good. Okay, so what is inverse ratio ventilation? So in this mode, in inverse ratio ventilation, we shorten the inspiration and lengthen the expiration. So what do we want to make sure is going on with these patients? We definitely want to make sure they're sedated adequately so that they're not fighting against that ventilator. What about your patient with high frequency oscillatory ventilation? What component do we want to make sure is on board for these patients? So these patients must be paralyzed. And here is your tip, you guys. If your patient is ever on a chemical paralytic, they must also be deeply sedated. Because think about it. What if you weren't sedated and you were paralyzed? That would be the most terrifying thing I could even imagine. So you absolutely have to make sure the patient is first very adequately sedated and then the paralytic is added to that. In your mechanically ventilated patient and you're following the ARDS-NET protocol, you're going to use high or low PEEP. The PEEP is going to be high in order to keep the FiO2 where? As low as possible. And it's going to meet those certain parameters for ARDS patients. So, what does high PEEP do to venous return? It's going to decrease venous return. And then what will that do to your cardiac output? It can reduce your cardiac output. Very, very good. Okay, so then we have our prone patients. This is going to require more or less ventilatory support when the patient is in the prone position. Typically, it's less ventilatory support. Even if your patient is on max ventilatory support, you'll notice that when they are not prone, their oxygen levels will be much lower than when they are prone. Okay, so keep that in mind. Let's see, let me move on a little bit now. Okay, so where is an OG tube? Where is it placed? It's placed orally. So we intubate the patient and we toss an OG tube in there. And then when the x-ray tech comes to confirm uh, the endotracheal tube placement, we also have them shoot a film to check for the OG tube placement as well. We kill two birds with one stone there. So that's why we tend to do it right away when we intubate the patient. Plus, they're sedated from the intubation and possibly paralyzed briefly for that. 
Okay, so we already talked about monitoring the blood glucose with the glucocorticoid therapy. So we're going to be removing excess fluid for our patient. What two medications are often used to do this? Albumin and furosemide, and in what order are they given? Yep, albumin first, which pulls the fluid into the vascular space, and then the furosemide to excrete it out. Okay, you guys did awesome on your pod quiz. And I will see you back here next week, same time, same place, to dive into cardiac electrophysiology a bit and talk about an EKG measurement that you may not have learned yet and one that is very important. It's the QT interval. And I also want to invite you guys to come follow me on the Instagram, Straight A Nurse. Come check it out. I share tips and fun things over there as well. So if you're not getting quite enough of me by getting the podcast every Thursday, come check it out, Straight A Nursing on Instagram. So I'll see you guys here next week. Bye for now. This podcast is brought to you by Straight A Nursing.